I got you. I think it's recording. Yes, it's recording now. So feel free to chime in and tell me what your if you have any experience with these some of these medications, especially with these. Um, you don't have. Oops, there's Jose, who was having technical difficulties. I've already taken several of. Them. Oh, Jose, you oh. are having issues. Yeah. Okay. So do I have, if you guys can uh, message Jose, I tell him I'll keep clicking to admit him, but it, I've, been doing, I've been doing this for about 10 times now. It, it won't take him. Looks like he's having some uh, network issues. Long-term search for lean, okay. We'll talk about that. So first, antidepressants. There, there are, I can't keep clicking you, Jose. I'm gonna start. You guys message Jose, it's not working. He needs a, new com a different computer. He needs something else. So Jose, I'm gonna put you to the side for now until maybe, all right. So antidepressants, yeah, let it, thank you. I can't communicate with him. I tell him I've been clicking on him to come in, but uh, looks like he's having some network issues. So well, with these depression, there's a lot of people who are depressed. I'm not sure if I told you guys last week in my final clinical group, they're all, they're all comparing what they're on. I don't know if nursing school did it, to them or what, but it's common. Here's a, um, here's a couple of people, famous people who are depressed. So with this depression, it doesn't matter who you are. Lady Gaga, Jim Carrey. I think Jim Carrey now is doing paintings and or something to deal with his depression. Uh, what is this lady again? Ellen DeGeneres. And this couple over here, uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, I didn't know they were depressed. But uh, if you Google depressed celebrities, they are on the top of the list. And also this guy right here, um, uh, who is this? Sup not Superman, Captain America. I did not, this is a good looking guy making millions and millions of, of uh, dollars and celebrity status and these guys are depressed. Good thing for them though, is they are functioning. Signs and symptoms of depression. One more time, Jose. All right, I think you're in. So overwhelming feelings of sadness, despair, hopelessness, and disorganization, low energy level. This is what I picture in my mind when I hear depressed. Remember Eeyore from uh, Winnie the Pooh? Hey, hello guys, I'm here. And uh, so they have sleep disturbances, lack of appetite, sexual, limited sexual appetite, and inability to perform activities of daily living. Some of these celebrities I showed earlier, these are highly functioning depressed um, people but there's also a lot who are not. So this is how it works. This is how our neurotransmitters in the brain works. We have the three main neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Upper left, the dopamine. It gives us our alertness pleasure, reward, motivation. I feel good, I'm drinking coffee. My dopamine is kicking in right now. Norepinephrine, I live in this building, so if there's an earthquake, I will probably go fight or flight and start running downstairs. Arousal, memory retrieval, diligence. 
And then the serotonin at the bottom. It's about well-being, pleasure, relaxation. This is my Zen part of the neurotransmitters. If you look in the middle, if all parts are working equally, I will be in a stable mood. Oh, I'm in. Are you know? Oh, you're in, Jose? All right. I tried. I clicked you like 50 times in two minutes. You kept coming in and out. So, um, so if I can have all my, all my dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin working together with just the right combination, I will feel good. You will feel good. The problem is it doesn't always work that way. There's this thing, the mon monoamine oxidase. And what it does, it, it breaks down these guys. It breaks down the dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. So now I don't have a balance anymore. Now my alertness level is lower, but my focus is higher, serotonin is higher. So it throws everything out of whack. And that's the main gist of our anti-psychotic medications to put me in a stable position where everything, where I can function. Actions of antidepressants therapy. I just said that it put, I need to put myself in a good place. Neurotransmitters. Here's a quick summary of what things do. The serotonin, oh, I mentioned this already about appetite, mood, hormones, memory, sleep. It's used for depression, migraines, and your norepinephrine increases the heart rate, BP, blood glucose. When we get to the cardiac, this medicine right here, it's a neurotransmitter, but it's also available in a drug form that we will give our patient when their heart rate is low, BP is low, blood glucose is out of whack. And we're not there yet, but we'll get there in the next few weeks. Same as the dopamine, it regulates the motor control. Motivation, reward, sexual gratification. The norepinephrine and dopamine are, we use that a lot in the, on the cardiac side of uh, medicine. About some drugs. There's four types of drugs I'm gonna talk about tricyclic antidepressants, which are your TCAs, MAO inhibitors, MAOIs, and, S and sel selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, and all the other stuff. First, TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants. They inhibit the presynaptic uptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. What does that mean? They reduce the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine into, into the nerves. So this one messes with the serotonin and norepinephrine, this part, the red and the yellow, to balance it off. Because for some reason, it's off. They're all the same. And just like with any other drugs, all most of these um, antidepressant drugs, we they are they are prescribed on a um, trial basis. Meaning, if you're depressed, I'm going to put you on this drug and try try for a couple of weeks or depending on the medication. If it doesn't work, we're gonna try on something else and something else and something else until we find the right formula for you. That's pretty much the, how most of the medications work. Indications, depression, sleep disorders. And also if you have a kid that's uh, is still peeing in bed at night, this may be prescribed to them if it gets really bad. A lot of these medications I'm gonna talk about today, they are metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. Okay. 
Well, contraindications, just like with any other drug, if they're allergic to it, recent MI, if they had a my, my yellow graffy done, which is a scan of the brain and the, and the spine, pregnancy and lactation. Remember these two, um, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine, and also uh, contraindicated in pregnancy and a person lactating. That's like a common theme. Cautions for these TCAs, cardiovascular disease, glaucoma, urinary retention, manic depressions. Remember with the urinary retention, because uh, this drug is excreted in the kidneys. If they can't pee it out, we are going to have the patient's going to have issues uh, metabolizing the uh, um, the drug, getting rid of the drug. So it may stay in their system longer. A drug to drug interaction of the TCAs that is important, especially for for the elderly are patients on oral anticoagulants. These are your Plavix. Um, can't think of anything else, but what is that expensive one? But uh, it messes with the oral anticoagulants. So if you have somebody who's on, on Plavix for heart attack prevention, stroke prevention, that is out the window. Their risk for strokes or MI increase dramatically because their, their um, anticoagulants is not as effective anymore. With these TCAs, there are three most common side effects or adverse reactions. Sedation, drowsiness is one of them. Next is a dry mouth and constipation. So you have to watch the patients for their for sedation. That means they cannot operate heavy machinery or drive. Dry mouth. If somebody has dry mouth, give them something to suck on. Give them a lollipop. Give them a candy, something, water, because it's going to be very irritating for these patients. And also constipation. Um, low dose, uh, we have to give them some mild laxative. And the other ones, sleep disturbances, fatigue, hallucinations, ataxia, nausea, vomiting. Those are not as common as the top three. What do you need to know as a nurse caring for these depressed patients? Your nursing assessment should include recent suicide attempts. You need to ask them, you need to know suicidal ideation. Do you have any plans for this, for your suicide that you're talking about in your sleep? And it also affects energy. So here's a um, question. First question of the day. How do I know, Lauren, I thought I clicked Lauren already. How do I know if a patient wants to commit suicide as opposed to somebody who wants to, I just want some attention. I want people to say hello to me. I want, I just want attention. How do we differentiate between these two people? You say it out loud, type it in the box. People who want to commit suicide normally just don't advertise that and just go ahead and attempt to do that versus saying, oh, I'm going to cut my veins or I'm going to jump off the bridge. Okay. So there's a lot of misconceptions actually with suicide and how it's talked about um, and what the risk factors and things like that are. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest or two of the biggest is a method and a plan. So they know mm -hmm. how they're going to do it and they know when they're going to do it. Um, Suicide is if someone mentions it to you, whether you know it's in joking or in passing, it should always be taken seriously. That is correct. That is why there's a, you will probably, when you do your clinicals and you have an admission and your nurse has an admission, please, please, please do the admission documentation with them. Because this is part of the questionnaire. And we're not, when we're asking the patient, we ask them, uh, do you have any suicidal ideation? 
standard question, we're not joking. We really want to know. And if so, it's going to, and you're entering it in the computer, it will trigger something. It will trigger the computer. It will trigger us. It should trigger us to notify somebody so we can address it. So yes, they do have a plan. And the 10, so those people, I'm not saying that they're not suicidal. They're, those people slitting their wrists, mainly want the attention versus people who are gonna do it, they have a plan. At four o'clock today, I'm gonna get in my car. Uh, it's half full of gas. I'm gonna drive 20 minutes to the bridge and at 4.30, I will jump. That's the plan. And they stick to that plan. They think about it. They've been thinking about this plan for a long time. Where's my mouse? I lost my mouse. So yes, they have a plan. So one of the, um, with these uh, TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants, it inhibits presynaptic reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. So it limits those because they're, for, for some uh, reason, there's a lot of them. So it, the balance is off. So this is what that medication does. The norepi and the serotonin side. Question, it's kind of easy. Pop quiz, patient presents at the clinic with, complaint, with complaints of insomnia, nocturia, and anxiety attacks. What should we give this patient? Imipramine or TCA tricyclic antidepressants. Okay. Oh, we're on Chris Evans now. That's his name. Captain America is Chris Evans. Next, side effects associated with TCAs. Pop quiz, what do you guys think? Does it mess with my breathing? Does it make my breathing slow? Make it fast? Does it make my heart rate go boom, 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 boom? Does it make me sleepy? It sedates the patient. Not completely sedate, but just kind of makes them a little lazier. And that is your TCA, tricyclic, fairly straightforward. That's it. That's all you need to know about that drug. Next is the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are three of them, Marplan, Nardil, and Parnate. This is used to, on patients who did not respond to the newer and safer antidepressants. In, I don't want that, there, I want this. So this MAOI inhibitors irreversibly inhibit the, um, the M it breaks down the norepi and serotonin side of it. I should go back to that. So the norepi and serotonin side of it. So to, again, we're all, we're all trying to be here in the middle, in a stable mood. Okay. And we don't really know what's lacking. So this is still a trial and error until we find a formula for our patient. So this MAO, it's gonna break down these uh, neurotransmitters. So what these MAOIs inhibitor does is it stops it. It stops the MAOs from doing their thing. You're gonna notice these a lot. Most of these drugs are not recommended for pregnant or lactating women. So if you have a, a pregnant or lactating women, ah, you, the choices for antidepressants are very, very limited. 
because same metabolizes in the liver, excreted in the uh, urine, and it crosses the placenta through the um, breast milk. So there's three medications that you need to remember for this one, MAOIs, Marplan, Nardil, and Parnate. An easy way to remember this would be Marnarpar. Marnarpar equals MAOIs. So if I ask, what are, give me three drugs that are MAOIs. Mar, nar, par, and I may probably make the other one like a beta blocker or something. So what do you need to know about this, um, this MAOI inhibitors? Before we get any further, tyramine regulates our blood pressure. So what the MAOI does is it breaks down the tyramine. So, oh, it blocks the breakdown of the excess tyramine in the body. So now we have a problem. What is the problem? My, well, this is what happens. Here's the um, storyline. The tyramine containing foods are normally broken down in the GI tract. And these are the tyramine tyramine containing foods, cheese, cured meats, processed meats, pickled foods, soy sauce, teriyaki sauce. So, oh, those are my staple foods, dried foods and wines. And the MAOIs prevent the breakdown, prevents tyramine from being broken down. So now there's gonna be a surplus of the tyramine which causes our uh, BP, uh, controls our BP, putting your patient in a hypertensive crisis. Your patient has to go to the emergency room for this. If they're in a nursing home, blood pressure is probably gonna be in 200 range. If they're at home, hypertensive, you're gonna, they're gonna be flush or other signs of uh, hypertension. So they need to come in for that and we can fix it. Contraindications for MAOIs, just like anything else. If they're allergic to it, we're not gonna give it to you. Um, CV disease, well, you don't need to know that tumor. Phenochromocytopenia. The generic name. It's just easier for me to say the, the brand name because instead of monoamine oxidase inhibitors for time purposes, I can go with the MAOIs. The question is, am I gonna be talking about generic name or brand name for the uh, test? Generic name, please. Adverse reaction, look these over, there's a lot. And it can be anything from GI, uh, neuro, liver toxicity, weight gain, dry mouth. So watch out for these adverse reactions. There's also interactions with other drugs involved with the MAOIs and other antidepressants can cause an uh, increase in BP. Methyl dopa, that Parkinson's medicine, it causes me to go fight or flight. My heart rate's gonna go up. Blood pressure is gonna go up. I'm gonna get flushed, vasoconstriction. And it's also, with insulin, it's gonna cause my blood sugar to go down. It's not gonna make the, the anti-diabetic drug as effective. So proper dosing is needed. I talked about this already. You're probably, probably gonna remember this. The food interactions with MAOIs are tyramine, tyramine rich foods which are your wine, cheese, uh, processed meats. Oh, can't see, but it says no aged cheese, processed meat, red wine, soy sauce, whatever I said before. True or false? I don't think I highlighted this one, but 
MAOIs are generally prescribed for people with depression who respond to safer drugs. Are generally prescribed for people with depressions. Well, I don't know. You guys are saying false. What if my copay for this more efficient, safer drug is fifteen hundred, and my copay for this is four four dollars? I think I'm going to sign up for this one. But the answer for this one is false. Now let's talk about some. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Here's a common, um, here's a few of them, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, and Lexapro. I've seen a lot of patients on uh, COPD patients on Lexapro. Here's another pop quiz. So why would, why would a, a COPD patient be on anti- Depression, anti-anxiety medication. Anyone, anyone? A COPD. Go ahead. To control their breathing? No. Anything, any other guess? Because they can't breathe, so they're anxious. Oh. Amy Schaff is the winner. They cannot breathe. This, remember with the COPD, this is a chronic breathing disease. They can't breathe for 10 years, 20 years. If I can't breathe for two minutes, I get anxious. Imagine for 10 years, 20, 20 years, no matter how long it is, you are not, these people do, will not get used to being short of breath all the time. It's being air hunger. I can't even imagine running down the street and catching your breath and feeling like that for a long time. So that's why a lot of them are on this thing. So SSRIs, indications, depressions, OCDs, panic attacks, bulimia, bulimia, PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder, post-traumatic stress disorders, social phobias, and social anxiety disorders. So this medication specifically blocks the reuptake of serotonin. It's the other one with little to no effect on the norepinephrine and dopamine. The goal of the selective, um, the SSRI, is to increase the serotonin levels. I keep going back to that because it's all about balancing. Because it is based on a theory that depression is caused by low levels of serotonin. Yeah. There's that triangle again, and it's about balance, balancing it out. What are the side effects of this drug? They're not all roses and rainbow. There's a lot. Look at the CNS, insomnia, headache, drowsiness, dizziness, anxiety, tremors, agitation, sometimes seizures, and GI. I'm gonna be constipated with the dry mouth, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, altered taste. I like to eat, so this is gonna suck for me. If I can't taste the food in the GU world, uh, painful menstruation, cystitis, sexual dysfunction, urgency, and impotence. The sexual dysfunction and impotence is one of the main reasons men just stop taking it. Because um, with these medications, you need to be tapered off of it. You can't just get off of it. So your doctor, you need to be, you need a follow-up appointment uh, so they can taper your dosage accordingly. But the main, for the CNS, the main side effect or the adverse effect is insomnia. They cannot sleep with this uh, when SSRI is on board.
There's also this thing called the serotonin syndrome, since we're talking about SSRI. It can occur if combined, if SSRIs are combined with other antidepressants and St. John's wort. If you're not familiar with the St. John's wort, it's a herbal medicine, it's a pill you can buy at CVS or Walgreens. And it, um, it's marketed, it says on the jug that it's for, it's to improve your mood, okay? Well, if you're on SSRI, it is contraindicated to combine these two. There's your St. John's wort, because a serotonin syndrome can occur. So what is the serotonin syndrome? These side effects that you see on the screen, high body temperature, agitation, increased reflexes, tremor, sweating, dilated pupils, diarrhea. Your body is freaking out because of this combination of drug that you introduce to your body. So SSRI plus St. John's wort is a no-no. Oh, I meant to put a big X on that. So it's a no-no. So if you're not on an SSRI and you take the St. John's wort, does that increase your serotonin levels? Oh, I don't know how the what the how the uh, St. John's wort work. So I'm not familiar with the herb. It sounds like it based on this um, the description. Here's a summary. Here's my drug guide for a drug card for SSR, SSRI. It inhibits central nervous system reuptake of serotonin with little effect to norepinephrine. Remember that. And on the side, there's a list of, um, of the SSRI drugs, the generic names. Um, one thing to remember here with the SSRI, which you probably remember already, it's right here in the bottom. It has the potential for hypertensive crisis. Keep that in mind with the SSRI. Two of the most common uh, SSRI prescribed are Prozac and Sarafam. Okay. Here's a pop quiz. I'm, I see a lot more patients on Prozac. I um, haven't heard of this uh, Seraphim until I started looking for a clip for it. So um, why do I see more Prozac prescribed to patient as opposed to Seraphim? What do you guys think? Or if I'm on a Prozac, maybe I can say, hey, doc, I'm going to try this Seraphim thing. It's not as common, but I heard a lot of good things about it. Can this cause hallucinations? Uh, hallucinations, I don't think hallucinations is one of the side effects. So insurance, that, hey, that's always a driving point in healthcare, insurance? Is it cheaper, popularity? For the serotonin syndrome? Um, oh, I'm gonna have to put an X on that, Morgan. Because um, the Prozac and the Seraphim, these are the a two exact same drugs. It's a brand name. It's uh, maybe it's an insurance thing. So if I have a patient that's saying, hey, I want to try Seraphim, but they're already on Prozac, I'm going to go, uh, man, you're already on it. It's just a different wrapper. It's a different box, different bottle. Yeah, I was asking if the uh, serotonin syndrome causes hallucinations. Mm -hmm. ah, I see. So, oh, if, if it causes hallucination, I don't remember seeing that on my uh, 
thing. So no. Here's another um, thing you need to remember with most of these drugs, actually all the drugs. Are you guys familiar with the black box warning? What is the black box warning? Oh, it says it up there on the screen. It is the highest, strongest drug safety actions of the FDA can implement. Um, so if, you, if you're on anything, if you're on some kind of prescription and when you open up your prescription, look for the black box warning. Uh, this may cause, let's say for this specific one, this may cause increased um, suicidal ideation, which is weird. I think uh, who was saying that last class? Jeff was saying a lot of these medicines we're giving these patients, depressed patients, uh, we're giving them, med them the medicine because they're depressed. And yet we are giving them a medication with the black box warning for high incidence for suicidal ideation. So why is that? Why do you guys think? Is it because we uh, try to find the right medication that works for them since all these work differently? If we put them out on one and it's not working with what they have? Yeah, yeah that can, I'll buy that, I'll buy that. Is it, because um, one of the things with medic, medic, medicine is, uh, are you guys familiar with the, the benefits and the risk? Or right here. We're playing, we're always playing this juggle in healthcare, in medicine. I want to give you this medicine to fix your depression because you want to, you have suicidal tendencies, but the side effect might be, is this, um, uh, you might have increased ideation for, um, for suicidal. So it's a balancing act that happens and it's, uh, there's a fine line and uh, it's tough, it's tough. So that's why they're prescribed this because the benefits will outweigh the risk for this specific patient. What am I saying here? Many antidepressants have a black box warning about suicidal ideation. So next is the, uh, the other antidepressants. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Wellbutrin, Remeron, Serzoni, Deseril, Effexor, but I'm only going to talk about the Wellbutrin. Something special about this Wellbutrin. It's not just an antidepressant. You know what else it's used for? Can anybody take a stab? Because some of these medications, antidepressant medications, are also used for something else that's totally out of this. Not, not in the realm of um, the disease. Smoking cessation. I see a lot of smokers here. Are you guys smokers? If you are, I'm not judging. We read, oh, I, should, I should not release it. So it's like fresh. So yes, it is for smoking. Ah, okay, it also says in ATI. So uh, who was it? There was a, a student in the first group said he was on this a few years ago, but uh, it didn't work on him. It, he, he said he, he ended up not quit. It just didn't work out with him. So um, there, then again, it's about trial and error to see what's going to work with your body. Two things not associated with sexual side effects and not associated with weight gain. No for the seizure patients. All right. Antidepressants, these medications are used in all ages, 
from a kid to a to an elderly. The difference is with the children, we have to be, they have to be careful because responses to these medications are unpredictable and the long-term effects are unknown. So if I put somebody on an antidepressant at, I don't know, let's say five years old, we don't know how, what's going to happen. What are the long-term effects five years from now, eight years from now? And for the young adults, let's say 16 to 20 to the mid 20s, it is important that these people be evaluated for the causes of the causes of the depression before starting them on antidepressants. Um, instead of just giving them, oh, you, you are depressed. I'm sorry, I feel bad for you. Uh, so here's a, here's a, here's a Zyvan, here's a something, take this because you're depressed. No, we're trying to stay away from that. That was the culture a long time ago, but now we have a lot of counselors, um, psych, uh, psychiatrists, psych NPs, psych nurses. So we're trying to get to the cause of it before the medication is the last, um, last ditch, um, last step, if we have to. And this is easy. How about this one? This is not so easy. Which antidepressant drug causes hypertensive crisis? I think it's the Wellbutrin, if I remember. Yeah. Because if I'm smoking, then it increases my blood pressure, increase, increases my, I think it's, it is, three SSRI, two, three. Three, two MAOIs. Two and three. Remember with the MAOIs, it's tied into the, uh, with the wine and the cheese. Remember that storyline? This can put me in a, ah, oh, it's too far back. But you can look over the, the slide. Let me see if I can get it here. This causes the hypertensive crisis. I mixed up the serotonin syndrome with hypertensive crisis. Ah, okay. Or now I just missed Was that. it mentioned for both MR, M, MAOIs and SSRIs? Because you I think we said it for SSRIs too, right? I think if it causes hypertensive, hypertension, I have to look back, but it's mainly for the uh, MAOIs. I think it's for the, um, now I'm looking back. I don't because it, it was circled in red, I believe. Mm. The hypertensive crisis was right there. Is it right there? At the, at the hypertensive. Very I guess my thing is wrong. Thank you for calling me out. SSRI and uh, MAOIs. Good call. Good. Thank you. So this is a team effort. MAOIs and SSRI. Ooh, so if that, if that was a test question, that would have been thrown out. Next, psychotherapeutic drugs. They are used to treat psychosis, perceptual and behavioral disorders. One thing to, oh, there, mouse is working. One thing to remember is these drugs do not cure the disorder. A patient who has um, psychosis will continue to have psychosis. There's, there's no treatment for it that we know of at this time. So what these drugs do it, is that it helps them function in a more acceptable manner so they can live their lives. They can go to work. They can do something. Um, so they don't have to be in a um, enough psych facility because they can't function. And they are both used in children and adults. One thing to remember here is children metabolizes this drug faster 
in adults slower. Let's talk about some uh, mental disorders and their classifications. First, schizophrenia. One of the famous people that had schizophrenia was this guy, Van Gogh. I think he said the paintings helped him cope, but then he eventually shot himself in his chest because um, he couldn't keep up. He couldn't cope with the voices that's been, that he hears. Next is mania or bipolar disease. A disease. Here's one guy that has a, I don't wanna be around if this guy's um, bipolar disease is acting out. Did you guys know he's a local here? I just learned that not too long ago. I knew that he was. He actually like breeds uh, pigeons as well in his house. He, he does what? Breeds pigeons. Like, oh, uh, yeah, I know he's a big yeah, yeah. guy. Yeah. I saw him at my gym too. one time. I'm a big fan, but I was too starstruck to get a selfie with him. Looks like he was a nice guy. Just shook his hand and said, hello, Mike. I'm a big fan. But should have whipped out my phone. And All right. That was my Mike Tyson story. ADD, this guy, highly functioning ADD person, uh, Justin Timberlake. He, don't quote me on this. He might even be the spokesperson for the ADD because yeah? he's, he's pretty out with it. And he lets everybody know that he's a highly functioning ADD as long as you can control it. So now schizophrenia, what's wrong with these guys? With the chemical imbalance that's happening in their brain, they have hallucinations, paranoia, delusions, speech abnormalities. They have, they, sometimes they can't function and it has a strong genetic association. Um, there's this, uh, um, have you guys seen this movie? A Beautiful Mind. I think this came out about 20 years ago. Russell Crowe used to be a stud at this time, but now I think he's gotten older and aged a lot. This is a true story of John Nash, one of the greatest mathematicians in history, won the Nobel Prize in economics, changed the game that impacted, uh, discovered the game theory that impacted our lives now. Both, wow. I'm hoping it's controlled. Julie? No, not really. I don't think anything like that is ever 100% controlled. It'll be controlled while they're on their meds, um, but then they feel better. They always stop taking their meds, which is typical with that disease. Okay. Because with this guy, with John Nash, he was highly functioning. And, but he has his periods, S same with your, uh, with your parents. Uh, they have his periods like a roller coaster. And this is... Uh, you see the nightmare of schizophrenia is not knowing what's true. Imagine if you had suddenly learned that the people, the places, the moments, most important. I screwed up that clip, I trimmed it wrong, but I meant to show um, him freaking out. He was hearing voices, so they had to call in the people to strap him down into the bed until he settles back down. Roller coaster. Well, here's a bonus, bonus Q&A. When you admit a patient in the hospital, they're gonna be, you're gonna be doing a, um, an admission history. Um, all about their medications and everything, health, surgical history, medications. So question is, should the nurse include, usually it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the patient. Should the nurse include the family when collecting patient's medical history on this patient with schizophrenia? 
Absolutely. Yes, yes. What about HIPAA thing? What if I'm the schizophrenic patient? I said, I don't want that guy in here. Um, unless the, they're deemed a ward of the state, I would say no. Hmm. Okay. Good. Good point. They might get. They might. So there it is. There it is. That's what I was looking for. They might not give accurate information, because one of the uh, um, things with the schizophrenic patients is sometimes they respond inappropriately to stimuli. Oh, they're lying because they're sick. That's speaking from somebody with uh, uh, experience from it. So yes, the answer here is yes. I would like, I would love to include the family member in uh, the intake of this patient. So antipsychotics also known as neuroleptic drugs or tranquilizers. Most antipsychotic drugs are dopamine receptor blockers. They are effective for helping people organize their thoughts, patterns, and, response appro and respond appropriately to stimuli. Um, I missed the clip when I trimmed it, but he was freaking out. He was confused, hearing things, kicking, spitting, biting. So what this medication does is it will bring him back down to where he needs to be. At the end of the day, it's all, st I'm still trying to balance my neurotransmitters. Try when these guys as much as possible. So antipsychotics. There's a poor compliance. I think Julie said this earlier, poor compliance with these medications. Like this guy, are you sure you need to be taking a medicine? Nope, nope, I'm not on anything. I'm good, I'm not on anything. Because there's a stigma attached to it. And um, that should be less now these days, but it still exists. Because if you find somebody who's on uh, antipsychotics, uh, especially in the, with these patients, they will think, oh, people will think I'm crazy, so I'm not going to take it. And, and there's that roller coasting thing um, because, that Julie was talking about. Side effects, hypotension, anticholinergic effect. It's like an allergic reaction. Sedation, weight gain, sexual side effect, fogginess, and this thing called EPS extra pyramidal effects. What is this EPS, extra pyramidal effects? So right here, they're walking around like they have Parkinson's, stoop posture, shuffling gait, they're stiff and uh, they're restless. Their feet are constantly moving, uh, facial grimacing, involuntary eye movement, it looks like they're having a stroke and Parkinson's. It's like a combination of things, of symptoms that we don't know what it is. Uh, chewing motion, facial dyskinesia. You guys get it? You don't. So I figured it's best to actually see it in action. So when, when did you start having trouble talking? Uh, uh. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh. Early this morning? Uh, and did you take any drugs? Uh, 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 other other than your prescribed drugs? Oh. Uh, no? You don't uh, do cocaine or anything like that? Oh. Uh, 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 no? Uh, okay. Count to ten for me. One, two, four, 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 uh, 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 uh. Okay, that's good. I do. I feel better. I feel like I can talk. I 
Say what I want to say now. Woo All right. Cool. I feel better. I'm, you know, I, I am glad that I came in to see you all. Hey, glad to see you all here at MCG. Quick question. Oh. Uh, has has the, the pupil on this eye, has it been bigger than the, the pupil on your uh, other eye for a while? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, it has. It has. Okay. It has. Okay. But has that ever been been ever since you had your head injury? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay. You still want to spin the head? Let's talk about it. Um, Count to ten for me now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Oh no. Now your your voice your voice isn't right. perfect, but is this how you normally talk? Uh, no. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, but your speech is still a little slurred. Yeah, uh, uh, because I had to take, I had to take out of my Okay. I don't feel better right now. Ten minutes later, that's fast. But that said, give me some Benadryl, and the doctor knew exactly what the purpose was. The purpose is, well, the purpose was to give me some Benadryl, and that's what they did for me. Give me some Benadryl. Now, are you talking back to normal for you? Is this, yes. this, is this how you talk? Yeah. Okay, all right. So you had some traumatic brain injury sometime yeah. in the past. Is yeah, that right? They, they killed my brain. Boom, there it is. So with how to treat EPS, you guys saw it in action. They gave them IV Benadryl. I don't know how much they gave them, 50, 25, it's gotta be 50 IV and it works quickly. Is it 50? Okay. And, but sometimes, actually most of the time, they give a combination of Benadryl and Cogentin. <clears throat> so Benadryl and or Cogentin is how we normally treat the EPS syndrome. Remember that combination. This is like the antidote for the EPS. Next, a typical antipsychotic drug. This is what clozapine. Something's something's uh, special about this drug. It's the management of um, of schizophrenia for unresponsive to standard drugs. Okay. There's a lot of drugs. Um, some have low side effects, medium side effects, but if they're not responding to it, this is the go-to drug. Clozaril, clozapine. Okay. It's a good drug, but it has a dark side, just like with the other one. This one is called the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's, one, it's a life-threatening adverse effect of the clozapines. Right here in my drug card, it's highlighted in the bottom. Neuro, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. What does that look like? So what is this neuroleptic malignant syndrome? malignant syndrome is toxicity of antipsychotic medications, especially those that antagonize the action of dopamine. On top of being a fatal disease, the patient would still have some permanent neurological damage after recovery. And as you can see, the presentation is mainly confusion and restlessness. The patient would keep moving all his muscles, including his tongue, for days, and this will increase myoglobulin by causing muscle damage and will also induce fever because of the metabolisms of muscles. He's got all four of them on, and he's been doing this all day and all night and he's still not tired. 
Hey, Brian. Can you look over here at me? Hi. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It is a fatal disease. Just like what the doctor or nurse said, this guy's been doing this for days. They've had to restrain this guy. Four point restraints with pads. What is that on his hands? Mittens. Looks like he has a trach too, probably a peg tube. So this is what happens with the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Here are your symptoms. We have, we have fever, encephalopathy. You can see it right there live on the screen. Vital signs dis dysregulation, enzymes elevation, cardiac enzymes, liver enzymes, whatever enzymes, it's just gonna be out of whack. Rigidity and hyperflexia. You saw it, they were trying to tie him down and um, they were having a hard time dealing with this patient. Next, mania and bipolar illness. What's the difference? Mania, periods of extreme overactivity and excitement. It's like when you ace a test, woo, you got an IVN, yeah, you got an NGN, whatever it is, good job. When you pass the NCLEX, good. So with the bipolar, it, it's, it's a roller coaster. Depression, by hyperactivity and excitement. Depression, hyperactivity and excitement. So you're, it's, it's a roller coaster ride for these patients. Uh, it could be from a uh, biochemical imbalance. And um, so that's, that's happening inside the brain. Drugs that are used to treat mania or bipolar. There's a few up here on the screen, lithium salts, Lamictal, Zyprexa, Seroquel. These are common, but what we're going to talk about is the lithium salts, lithane, lithotabs. Can I tell you guys a secret? It's salt, just salt. Not table salt. It's kind of like a toxic salt. Because with this toxic salt, with this salt, it alters the, um, the nerve, the sodium transport be between the nerves and the muscle cells. So, um, and that's how they work. And in, with this uh, lithium salt, this is what it messes with. Boom, these two, the do uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. So with these patients, it is critically important to monitor, oh, oh there, it is critically important to monitor their labs closely. Um, when these patients, when we first start a patient on this thing, we will probably monitor their lab every 12 hours or so while they're in the hospital. If you go outpatient with this, or you're probably gonna need a um, lab test at least once a week every two weeks, every three weeks, until this is regulated in your system. Because if you look at the screen here, there's different levels. Uh, anything under one, actually a 1 1.2, we're good, we're golden, you're where you need to be. But when you start going up in the numbers, 1.5, you can have some slurred speech. When you go up into the one to the two range, you're gonna have some EKG, EKG changes. Uh, we're starting to get in the danger zone. Um, two to two and a half, ataxia, clonic movement, and seizures. Oh, bad, bad, bad. More than two and a half, multi-organ toxicity, significant risk for death. It is imperative we get lab tests done on this patient reg regularly, and that is not negotiable. I have bipolar or type one with mixed feature. If you guys have any questions, oh, are you on any medications? Are you okay to answer that? Lauren? 
Absolutely. I'm happy to answer that. I have worked for the past seven years to be able to come off medication. So I manage it through behavioral therapy and um, through holistic measures because of the side effects of these medications. What side effects did you not like? Any of them. Um, there's one that is a medication called Risperdal. Um, and I was on it when I was younger and it actually um, was a, there was a class action lawsuit against it because it caused the gyno Plamastia in men, it, they build breast tissue. Yeah. Um, and for me, <clears throat> I couldn't go to school for several weeks because I actually started lactating as a 13 year old girl because of that medication. Um, and it was incredibly painful and awful. Also, um, a lot of these antipsychotics lock you into what you would deem as the best way I can explain it is SpongeBob normal pants. I don't know if any of you guys watch SpongeBob, but when SpongeBob becomes normal, and he's like kind of just flat. He has no emotion, no affect. Um, that's what a lot of these medications do. They don't allow you to feel happy um, and they don't allow you to feel sad. They just kind of lock you in the center. Um, I mean, and there's a lot of other things too. I have um, bone loss in my mouth from medications. I have um, tremors. I, there's, yeah. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, but don't think that unmedicated means untreated. That is a misconception. Okay, good. Especially now with all the non-medicinal therapy. Good, thank you. Feel free to share anything else when we get to something. So drug to drug interactions of the lithium, bad news with the Haldol. Tegatrol and thiazide. Here's another pop quiz. We got to the pop quiz part of this. Why would it be bad for lithium to be combined with an HCTZ or thiazide diuretic? I think I just gave it out, gave it away, but you guys got it. diuretic and salt. Toxicity, lose, lose too much salt. I think the levels of dehydrated higher when you uh, use the diuretics. So you're gonna be like um, toxicity, yeah, of lithium. I like the toxicity. I like the dehydration because yeah, this is. Um, that's why it's important for these patients to be hydrated very well because the HCTZ helps prevent the body from absorbing salt. And I'm trying to give this patient salt and the, this drug won't let me absorb it. So it's kind of, it's a mute. There's some considerations. I need a good HMP on these patients. I need to know A, if you're allergic to anything before we get any further. Renal, cardi cardiovascular disease, because you're gonna excre excrete this through the kidneys and CV with the sodium CV. You guys know how that's related with my cardiac. Dehydration, there's a star by the dehydration because it's extremely important for these patients on lithium to be hydrated well, or it messes with their sodium levels. It brings it down if they're dehydrated. Um, sodium depletion and use of diuretics. Okay. What am I assessing with these patients on lithium? Urinary output. I need to know if you're peeing okay. I need to know if your renal function is working. Okay. And liver and renal function tests. So we're going to do those uh, blood tests. I talked about this already. The lithium levels we will be checking those regularly. Again, fluid balance is very important for these patients taking lithium. Pop quiz time. What is your primary action of the lithium? It, it inhibits the release of, there's two of them on the top that I remember. I can remember my triangle. Dopamine, I forgot worse. 
the, the dopamine and the norepinephrine. All right. Ooh, this is a little tricky. What is the priority assessment for a patient taking lithium? It's gotta be pain. That's a lot of salt. Sometimes when I drink salt, it hurts. And my white blood cell comes up. And then my pupils get dilated. You guys got it. This is critically important for these patients. All right, now let's talk about Justin Timberlake. ADD, inability to concentrate on one activity for longer than a few minutes. Huh, let me have this. State of hyperkinesis kinesis, and usually diagnosed in school aged children, but also can occur in adults. These are three celebrities who are, um, who have ADD and they're out with it. I don't know what's the tie in with the ADD and these Olympians. Uh, I forgot the name, was it? Simone and this Phelps guy. They're, I think they're the most decorated Olympians in history or something like that. There's gotta be a tie in with ADD and training for your sport. I don't know what it is. No, there. So, um, where am I? Oops. So with these ADDs, hyperactivity, they can't focus, they can't, they can't function sometimes. Um, so what kind of drugs do you think we would give these? Oh, it says on the screen, we would give these patients CNS stimulants. I, I did this slide wrong. We would give these drug stimulants. Why is that? What do you, why do you think we're giving a stimulant to this brain that's going pop, 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 pop already? I can't even, I'm, I'm hyperactive active, and yet you want to give me a CNS stimulants? I what know why do it does that. I know why we give those actually. Oh, help us out. Well, because I have ADHD, so they have to give me a stimulant. The reason is because your um, CNS um, in your brain, like literally in the middle of your brain, your thoughts get stuck because they can't transmit between, um, between everything up there. So the stimulant actually opens it up and allows for your thoughts to, to flow, basically, is how, how it was explained to me by my doctors anyway, and what I've read. Um, so yeah, it actually stimulates your thoughts and it stimulates the um, conduction of your, um, your neurons. So there it is. But if you're at looking at it at face value, it just doesn't make any sense. It's not like a mathematical equation that one will cancel each other out and put me back down. Right, but you would think that it would make you hyper, but when you actually need it, you don't feel hyper at all. You don't feel any effect from it whatsoever. You just feel like you can think and things are less stressful and you can think through problems easier. That's basically the effect of it, but you don't have any um, physical effect, maybe a little bit at the end of the evening when it's wearing off, but other than that, unless you drink a lot of caffeine, if you drink caffeine, you'll definitely feel it a lot, uh, very jittery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So good. Good. This is good first hand experience. Increases dopamine and norepinephrine. There's, there's those stimulants. Those are my stimulants. Increases alertness and focus. As Julie was saying. So there's some side effects to this thing. And here's a few. Nervousness. Psychosis physical addiction. Some people get addicted to this. And one of the most common, if not, this might be the only drug for um, this is the uh, methylphenidate or Ritalin. And I just found out from the last, uh, from last uh, group that people take this uh, 
to feel good, uh, unprescribed as a recreational drug. I did not know that. People used to take that a lot when I was in high school. They used to call it cheap speed. Oh. Okay. Yeah, high school kids. <laughs> All right. So nursing considerations with this uh, drug. I need a good HMP, just like with anybody, anything else. And with this uh, medication, sometimes we start them off as, oh, you said you started at 13. Sometimes we start them off younger than that. And when we do, I need a good, you need a good weight on these kids regularly. Because as kids grow, the dosage changes. So uh, keep that in mind. Here's other... Um, Glaucoma, oops. Oh, there we go. Glaucoma, pregnancy lactation. There's that kidney. It keeps that kidney thing keeps showing up because that's where it's excreted. Warning, warning. It may be habit forming. Warning for people with heart disease combination with the MAOIs, history of depression, mental illness, bipolar, and may cause blood circulation problems. And it also causes insomnia if given at night. So we should give this, uh, we should take this during the day. Next, Thorazine. For schizophrenia, psychotic disorder, uh, acute intermittent porphyria, mania, uh, mania associated, associated with bipolar disorder. And this thing here, this is completely off. Intractable hiccups, Thorazine for hiccups. And when, um, when did this, predicament start? Uh, according to the doctor, it started when I was born or shortly after then. Um, but I've had the hiccups now for almost five weeks. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On a regular basis? Um, much like they are right now. Sometimes worse, wow. um, but constantly. So it's very disruptive. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. It's very disruptive. So it is almost these hiccups are almost synonymous with Thorazine when you get to the hospital. If you have somebody else having a hiccup, this is what we go for. Let's imagine this lady who's been doing it for, what did she say, five weeks. Oh, I need some Thorazine stat on this lady. It is, it looks like it. Precautions with this thing. Same thing, risk during pregnancy may cause drowsiness or dizziness. So if it's gonna cause drowsiness or dizziness, please tell my patient, stop, do not drink alcohol with this. Drink plenty of water and avoid getting overheated. Because if you're on Thorazine, your skin may be prone to sunburn and it can cause dry mouth. Oh, actually not, not can cause, it will cause dry mouth. So with that lollipop, if I give my patient a lollipop, a candy, water to sip on, something to keep it in their mouth because it can be, can get irritatingly dry. And we talked about that. So here's the drug card for the uh, Thorazine. It says right there for the hiccups. My next medicine is called Haldol. Haloperidol, schizophrenia, psychotic disorder, and what am I doing? Tourette's. This is the awful, confronting reality of Tourette syndrome for Bianca Sayers. This 16-year-old has the most severe case of Tourette's in Australia. 
And it's brutal watching her lose the struggle for self-control. First diagnosed with an innocent blinking tick when she was three, since then, Bianca's got progressively worse, unable to suppress her violent outbursts or her language. That is ugly. It looks like she's overacting. It looks fake, but that's her. So in these cases, how dull is the answer for these uh, patients? I'm sure they tried that and probably didn't work. So There's a uh, precautions for a uh, how doll. Because another use for how doll is uh, when we get, when you guys get to the hospital setting and somebody's getting buck wild on you, uh, they're getting combative. They're kicking, punching, cussing you out. One thing we give them is how doll. It will calm them down. But we don't use it for patients with Parkinson's disease or, or if they have any CNS issues or oh, B52, yes, please. And also not for dementia because if we combine patients, uh, how dull with dementia patients, it increases their mortality rate significantly. So if you have a demented patient who is going wild on you, we're looking, thinking of something else than a how doll. It also causes um, um, cardiac irreg irregularities. So most of these patients will be on a cardiac monitor when you get to the hospital. What are the side effects of CNS stimulants? Maybe it decreases my blood sugar. I start itching, start seeing things. Oh, psychosis looks like C and D might be together. Maybe B and A. Take a guess, take a jump, take a C, D, 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 D. D, psychosis is my, is my answer. Is Ritalin habit forming? Actually, it depends on the dose, I think. High doses, yes, because it makes me feel good. It makes me get active, especially those high school kids. They take it. Yes, it is. So with this medication, Thorazine, what are my precautions for it? Select all that apply. Precautions for Thorazine. Boom, boom and boom. A C E F, ooh. That sounds about right. A, A, C, E, F. Yeah, that's right. I think I missed a uh, A, C, E. I forgot my, uh, yeah, I did miss my thing on the E. Yes, heart problems too in angina. That's why they're on the cardiac. Thing. Indications for Thorazine. ADD, Tourette, hiccups, hiccups. It's that when you think, when you think of hiccups, just think Thorazine. I think that that young lady was uh, in law school or something. Let's talk about anti-seizure medicine. So if you guys have any, uh, if you have seizures or any of these medications, let us know. Because uh, I work at, um, still work at Spring Valley Hospital, and we are a neurosurgical unit. We get a lot of seizure patients. And this is what happens. A quick review. There's a lot of um, things going on in your brain. A lot of, um, so what happens is these electrical, ooh, just had a quick. Chapter 23, PowerPoint. I just, 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 I
You can click on chapter two. Anti Parkinson's. Okay. Remind me later because I have to look to see what it is. Callie. Okay. So all these uh, electrical activity is happening inside your brain. It's just going pop, 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 pop. There's so much action. And that's why your body is freaking out. But first, let's talk about the two types of seizures. One, uh, generic seizure is the most prevalent of the neuro neurological disorders. And it's uh, different syndromes. And you don't have control of it. And the first time you have a patient that's seizing on you, it will, you will remember. You'll probably freak out because you don't know what to do. If that hap this happens to you, just start yelling for help and people will come. Nature of seizures seems to be caused by abnormal neurons sensitive to stimulations. Remember, you're inside your brain. Everything is firing at will. So two types of seizures. We have generalized and partial. They used to be called grand mal and petite mal. Now we have generalized and partial. This is what a generalized seizure looks like. You know, imagine if this is your patient and you are on your first, you just got off orientation and you're ready to go. And now your patient does this. I would be scared. You had several clients like that. Okay. So that's good that you mentioned several clients. That means you are familiar with it. You've seen it. You know how to deal with it. See what they did there? They put the patient on the side. You put the patient on the side. One of the worst thing you can do for a patient that's having a seizure is protect their airway by putting your, your finger in their mouth. Don't, don't, don't do that. Because they will chomp on your finger and oh, they will not let go. And this is normally what happens after a seizure. This is what we call a post-ictal, where everything just kind of settles down. Keep in mind, this patient probably just peed or, or pooped himself so, because they did not have control. Next is the focal seizure, where in, with, the, with the previous seizure, everything is firing with the focal seizure, it's just one little part over here, one little part over here, over here. My parents just thought I was did see and oh, oh no. It, well, Lauren, this is you right here. This is probably what was happening to you. This lady is having a seizure right now, a partial, a focal partial seizure. Not knowing this lady, she could be your coworker sitting at a desk next to you. They look, she looks like she was just being ditzy and what are you doing? Just kind of grazing off in the world. But she was having a seizure because this uh, partial seizure only affects a small part of the brain. She's still having the seizure and they maintain awareness during the seizure. So hopefully, well, my, they, your parents thought you were dead see and spaced out often. Partial, text, textbook partial seizures. Hopefully you ended up seeing a neurologist and got your seizure under control. Please say yes, just say yes, just type yes. Okay, thank you. That would be bad if, uh, they have it. So the drugs typically used to treat generalized seizures 
stabilizes the nerve membranes and it puts the central nervous system whoosh right here. It sedates them, it slows them down. It turns off a lot of these neurons firing. And when we do that, this is what happens to the patient. We knock them out. I'm okay with them uh, being knocked out, being sedated. They're not seizing. And so after we give this medication, we have to monitor these patients closely, especially the breathing part with the lorazepam. Status epilepticus, what is this thing? This is a different kind of seizure. Uh, with the breathing, status asthmaticus. That status means something. Status asthmaticus is asthma, uncontrolled by standard medications. I can give my patient, that, there it is. I can give my patient albuterol all day and I'm still wheezing. Same with status epilepticus, continuous seizures, but there's an antidote for it. There's a drug of choice that we use for the status epilepticus, phosphenitoin. This is what we use for the status epilepticus patients. Okay. You also have the um, carbamazepine used to treat seizures, but for the most part, those are good for maintenance, but for status epilepticus, this is what I want, phosphenitoin. Let us, anything here can impact child's learning and say, eh, there's nothing here that I need to, let's skip this one. So um, using these uh, anti-seizures on uh, adult patients, first thing is I need to monitor. I need to make sure this anti-seizure is working for you and your case. I need this. I need the medic alert. If you're an elderly or on your, on your cell phone, that needs to be there. Because when the EM, if you're having a seizure and I'm a paramedic, I come to your house, I don't know if you're having a seizure or you are overdosed on something. So I'm a paramedic, I'm, I'm not judging, but they do, we do. Other uh, things to consider for the adult patients is uh, associated with fetal abnormalities, congenital effects for the pregnant people. So try not to get pregnant if you're on a anti-epileptic medication. Young adults, I need to talk about these young adults because we have young kids. Oh, when I say young adults, I'm gonna say between 16 to 22 years old. These kids are at, the, at their prime. They're graduating high school. They're supposed to be going out to college, having a good time, but not so fast, Mr. Young Adult. It's, uh, there's this one thing um, that they can't do if they're on this medication, especially in the beginning stages of it. They cannot drive. I need to take the, I think the DMV or the doctor, I don't know who takes away the, the med, their, uh, their driver's license, uh, their driving privileges but it gets taken away from them. So can you imagine an 18 year old kid just graduating high school, supposed to go to college, go out having a party and sorry, Jojo, you cannot drive the car and you will not be able to drive the car for a long time until this is uh, taken care of. That puts them in depression right there because they're supposed to be going out with their friends, with their buddies, they're gonna live their life but you just kind of put an X on it. Ah, see, your brother is epileptic. They took his license away. How, how old is your brother? He actually, he started having seizures when he was 16 and um, he, he couldn't get his driver's license for a while, but they 
took it away. And I think he was on clonopin for a while. Um, and they re- they let him reinstate it uh, after he went six months with no seizures. Okay. Now he's 30. Wait, how old is he now? 30. He'll be 33 in December. Okay. And it's all under control from here from since then? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, when he takes his medica- medicine, he, he kind of had a rough start. You know, it kind of made him depressed and everything. And he tried to self-medicate and drinking and stuff like that. But now he's okay as long as he takes his medication. Okay. <laughs> it takes some time. So if I'm the, if I'm the 16-year-old kid, shit, I'm going to try and figure this out myself. So it's probably what your brother did. So sometimes, yeah, these patients get depressed because they can't drive. They can't, they can't live a good, they can't have a good time. And it's not going to affect them going to college. It's not going to affect them having sex with their girlfriend or boyfriend. It's not going to affect anything. It's just this driving thing that gets them. And for the older adults, same with these older adults, they're on a lot of different medications. And a lot of these medications, they mix together. So the physician needs to be very careful to see what they're on. And same, same uh, uh, they also need this. It's almost a standard if you have seizure. I hope your brother has one of these or on his phone or something. Now, next, let's talk about. Oh, yeah, sorry. I tried to click on mute. Yeah, he used to. Um, oh. Yeah, okay. I know he used to. He has it on his phone, though. Yeah. So, next is uh, high band toins. These are less sedating seizure medicines. They may be the drug of choice for patients unable to tolerate sedation and drowsiness, they can function. They're okay. It works the same as all the um, other uh, seizure medicine, anti-seizure medicine, decreasing excitability and hyper excitability. It stabilizes the nerve membranes. uh, So it stops this from happening inside the brain. So with most of these seizure medications, they all have this absorb, ab, absorbed in the GI tract, metabolizes in the liver, excreted in the kidneys, in the, yeah, kidneys. There's some numbers up here on the screen, therapeutic levels of phenytoin, ethotoin. You don't really need to remember this. You can just kind of eyeball it for now, because especially when you get to the clinical setting, I'm not going to test you on it, when you get to the clinical setting, I'll probably explain it to some of the other groups that numbers at this place is going to differ from numbers at this place. So it's kind of, we don't need to memorize it. Uh, monitoring of these patients is, um, especially for phenytoin, increases the likelihood of adverse effect. So the nurse would um, assess for liver toxicity bone marrow suppression, or serious dermatological reactions. So if they went from there to there, that means something's wrong, let's do something about it. Call the doctor, check some vitals, do something. Oh, here's another one, contraindications and cautions with high dentoins. There it is again. It's always going to be there. The known allergies, same pregnancy lactations. What I want to focus on with the uh, phenytoin is that at the bottom, it can cause gingival hyperplasia. It is common on patients, especially children who are on phenytoins. So this thing is when the gums grow too much and they start covering the teeth. And uh, so it is important. So it is important that they see the dentist regularly instead of yearly, maybe three, four times a year. So they can address this. Pop quiz. What drug is a hydantoin 
that may be the drug of choice for patients who are unable to tolerate side effects of drowsiness and sedation. Clonazepam, phenytoin, pre, pre oh, oh, B, 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 phenytoin is, looks like phenytoin is the answer. All right, now let me talk about some barbiturate, barbiturate-like drugs. Same thing, they, all these seizure medicine work the same by decreasing excitability and hyper excitability. Um, same as high ventoins. Contraindications for this, known allergies, pregnancy lactations, mm, caution with the elderly. Mm, all of that is the same from the other ones. They're all in the same classifications. Uh, one thing about this drug is the adverse effect. There's a lot here from depression, confusion, lethargic, you can't drive, uh, cardiac arrhythmias. But one thing here that stands out is this, loss of libido. They cannot function, and which is why some guys stop taking it. And it's part of the education plan as a nurse. Next are these uh, phenobarbital, primidone. These are associated with significant CNS depressions. So they may need to be on something else. My patient is seizing. What am I gonna give them? Ah, oh, phenobarbital. Because if I administer this medication in five minutes, I mean, uh, IV form, it will start working in five minutes. If I give it to my seizing patients, I am or sub Q form, 30 minutes is my onset. Or if I give them a pill, which I don't know why I would give a pill to somebody having a seizure, but it's there. But it works within an hour. So pop quiz. So I'm a mom. Oh, let's go with it. I'm a dad and my, my kid is having a seizure. And the question, my question is, my kid is having a seizure. I see you giving him a um, phenobarbital right now. When is the seizure gonna stop? What do you guys think? What are you gonna tell me as the parent? You're giving this IV injection. When is the seizure going to stop? He's been seizing in five minutes, in five minutes. Well, that's what the inset, insert says. It works in uh, onset is five minutes. Five minutes, five minutes. This is kind of like a trick question, which. So in five minutes, my phenobarb is going to stop. It's going to start working. But in this case, I may need to do something else to get my, uh, my patient's uh, seizures under control because I don't want to wait five minutes um, for, to stop the seizure. So I might need to get something else. So I'm, I'm going to use this medicine in combination with something like lorazepam or other seizure medicine. It's like a one-two combination. Okay, so the, I'm going to tell my patient, my mom, my, my patient, uh, parent, this medicine is going to start working in five minutes, but I'm going to do something else to stop the seizure right now. Okay. It's like a one two combination. Benzos, same, it decrease, ex decreases excitability and hyper excitability to stimulation. These are some of the uh, drugs we use. Clobazam, clonazepam. You've probably heard a lot about diazepam or Valium. Um, that is the most common. A drug-to-drug -drug interaction with this one is, don't drink, please stop drinking. 
there's uh, some CNS depression that happens with this in combination with your alcohol, then there might be some bad reactions. They can be. Oh, okay. Yes, they can be, uh, Adela. Take the azepam all the, okay. Is that what you're using to control? Get your... Yeah, that's part of my thing. Um, they give me Adderall and they give me um, diazepam. Okay. Oh. Pharmacokinetics, these are generic. I should just stop putting these up. Absorbed in the GI tract, metabolizes in the liver, excreted in the urine. There's your half-life, a long time. Now let's talk about the focal seizures. We give succinamide to these patients. Xerontin, Celantin, Celantin. It works the same, but it's uh, since the, the effect is happening in the brain is focal. So it kind of focuses on that because it doesn't, there's, there's not much electrical activity going up there except for this thing that's firing, firing, firing. So it hones in on that. It has the same effect as all the other anti-seizure medicines. Peak in one to seven hours, depending on the drug. Contraindications. I should just, I think I'm just gonna put all these stuff. The, all these drugs here, anti-seizures, all have, are all contraindicated for pregnancy, lactation, unless it's something specific. Just like this one. This one has uh, contraindicated for porphyria, which is a skin disorder. Adverse effect of this. Oh, this one is specific. Succinamides, CNS depressants, and it also suppresses your bone marrow. Keep that in mind with the succinamides that's used for focal seizures. Drug to drug interaction, primidone. And let me fast forward through all these other drugs. I don't want to, there's not much to do here. Mm. There was this one here. See with this uh, other partial seizure medicine, CNS depressants and alcohol. It's all the same. It's, so when you get to the seizure part of the, um, the medication, no alcohol, see, it causes CNS depressants. And I'm not gonna expect you to remember the drug to drug interactions with these, um, with these medications because there's a lot. So I said up here, consult a drug guide because there's so much. We're not, you're not gonna remember all this. One thing to remember though is the pill, it interacts with the pill. So if you are somebody who's trying not to get pregnant and um, you take some of these, um, you're on anti-seizure medicine, there might be a little surprise for you at the end. Nursing considerations for uh, patients receiving uh, partial seizure medications. There's the key right there history of bone marrow suppression, where everything else will be the same. EEG if appropriate, but it doesn't matter really what kind of seizure you're having. If we need to do an EEG, we will. There's that surprise. It will decrease the effectiveness of the pill. So no surprises there. Alcohol, no to the alcohol. Seizure medicines and alcohol do not mix. Oh, one more thing, driving. 
if you're oh we, I think who I forgot who we said it earlier uh, they took the her brother's driver's license because you cannot operate machinery uh, and at least until they regulate your seizure activity you are not allowed to drive question number two the use of succinamides with a specific drug will cause decreased serum levels. Which of the following would be the best choice if I can't use that? D, 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 Decreased levels of primidone. That's it. That's all I got. Questions, questions. Throw some questions. There was a question earlier about uh, how am I going to structure the test? Um, I forgot who asked it, but he said uh, when Ludi, Dr. Ludi, what's her name? Dr. Lassus would take the, give the test, she would put the classifications instead of um, knowing a specific drug, such as the my beta blocker here is working to on the cardiac cells, uh, something like that. So instead of being specific of this metoprolol drug is um, is doing something this coreg. So I think I'm going to restructure it to be more a more generic than than specific drugs. What other questions do we have? Which means I have to go back and change all that stuff. Thank you for that, because I heard a lot of those exams and make a lot of sense. You should. On the PowerPoint, if I didn't talk about it, it will not be there. If I mention it, discussed it, talked about it, because I, I don't want to test you on something, read chapters one through 469, and it's on 468 on the very last page. And it's, I don't know, it's just, I don't think it's fair. And what I'm talking about here is, something relevant and when we get to our um, to our clinical setting it's applicable when's our first test it's right now get ready no it's uh next no in two weeks i think june 1st i guess you're not ready julie i'm not ready either i gotta change the the format I ever feel ready. <laughs> other questions, other questions. If not, that's it. If you're in my clinical group, I'm grading your, uh, I'm looking over your clinical paperwork now. And just look at the feedback and uh, it should be good. We're off to a good start. Next week or tomorrow, what is it now? On Thursday, assessment and med pass. That's on the things to do list for that day. That's it. So I just want to say that was a really great lecture, Professor. It's definitely uh, one of the best uh, presentations in the material I've seen. Oh, there you are. You do look like Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me see. Oh, maybe not. I think it's the lighting. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta get one of those ring flash lights or something. I think that might just do the trick. <laughs> All right. Check it out. Right, we'll send the link guys. to everybody. Thank you. See you on Thursday and Friday.